God is our refuge and God is our strength, a very present help in trouble. God is our refuge and God is our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore I will not fear Though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Hello, family. I pray that your anchor is firm in Jesus Christ. And though the waves seem pretty rough at times, Jesus is in the boat with us, and we have that confidence and strength. I trust that you had a good weekend. We start another uh, week, and I pray that you will get excited about the projects we have given to you. Uh, yesterday, Carol and I had a sabbatical, a Sabbath, and uh, I got permission to say this. It's not really a joke, but it was so funny, it made me laugh all day long, and I went to sleep laughing. So I don't know if you're going to get it, but it's real cute. My security guard came and said, Pastor, somebody made dog poop in your yard. And I laughed so hard, and she didn't know why. Figure that one out. Okay, moving on. Uh, Henry told me that uh, there is a 24-7 website you can go to that has the camera focused on the Western Wall in Jerusalem. Many of us have gone there. Of course, we always go to the Western Wall, and some of you have been there with me. Uh, and you would, might want to send in a prayer request through the email, through the Internet. Uh, so you go to AISH.com. 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 24-7, the camera is there. There are not too many people there now because of this epidemic to the pandemic. And they are, um, like us, staying at home. But they have some rabbis out there. And what they do is, if you give your prayer request, they will put it in the wall, like all pilgrims do, as we have done when we went there, put a prayer request there, because this is a place we believe is the closest to second... Chronicles 7.14, in the dedication of the temple, this is the wall that was remaining where God's presence, God says, I will hear your prayers from this place. This is a very special place. So if you'd like to do that, um, send your prayer request. Maybe in the middle of the night, you're restless and you're fearful, and you can just type out your prayer request on that uh, .com, A-I-S-H dot com, and they will put it on the wailing wall for you. Then every day they take it away, the rabbi comes and takes it away, and I think they burn it as the sacrificial offering to the Lord. We also need some more water and disposable masks if you have for our ohana, and they always need towels and blankets and uh, toiletries. So if you have that, some of you are cleaning your house, and so you can drop it down here. And I was watching, uh, I was looking at our Facebook account because we had some problems with the music. We had registered the music, but if you went later on, you found perhaps that the music was, some of the music was blanked out. We're fixing that. But while I was doing that, I found Pia and Kim Lontanda, they were having a prayer meeting in uh, the Philippines, so I kind of joined them, and I didn't understand everything. They were speaking some in their own language, but it was wonderful to be with the family of God, my family in the Philippines. You might want to look it down if it comes out on your Faith in Jesus account. They have all kinds of things there, but I somehow got that, and I was really happy to do that. Okay, so just remember that tomorrow is our healing service. And for those of you who have a prayer need, I want you to know that uh, we want you to focus in on that, get into the scriptures, get your heart ready. If you need to fast a meal, you can do that. 
and prepare your heart to expect something. We just don't pray for the sick. When we pray, we expect something to happen. And that's what faith is. In fact, I heard a preacher say, God has already promised us everything we need. We need to pray differently. We need to make our requests known with thanksgiving, telling him how wonderful he is and grateful how grateful we are for his faithfulness, then we just praise him. God, I know that you have healing for my knees or healing for my back or whatever, and start worshiping the Lord. And as I said, when you worship the Lord and pray in the spirit, it is so powerful. So don't rush on when we have this. In our services that we have here, we do take time to worship. I feel like, you know, unless we feel and know that the presence of God is here. We've just had a, a meeting, uh, and uh, maybe I'm the superstar because I'm the one talking so much. But it's not about me. It's my job as a pastor is to help bring down the presence of God. The Holy Spirit is in all of you who are born again, and with that spirit, we worship God, and that's when the words of knowledge come forth and people get healed and people, you know, as they're praising God, receive their answers to their prayer. So always come, even in the evening services like this, the devotional, come expecting something good. God is a generous God. And he wants to do good things for us. He didn't say, ask and not want to give it to us. He didn't say, I will supply your need and then not hear us. We need to meet his conditions. And this is why we study the word. He says, you know, the righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them. And so I want you to learn these simple principles so that you will have a very effective prayer life. I also want to thank James for making this little podium for me so I can put my things up here and that makes it very comfortable. Now everybody get out your paper and pencil and I'm going to give you the Bible scramble verses. And tonight we're going to teach about obedience by the children. It's a command that has a, long, has a promise, and the promise is that we're going to live long. So I'm going to teach you about that from Ephesians chapter 6, so you may want to turn to that. But here are the Bible scramble scriptures that I thought young people should know, and maybe not only uh, that one verse, because it's many times in the context of a wonderful, encouraging story. So it's a good time to learn these Bible characters and learn the principles why these stories are there so that we can learn from their mistakes or their example and we can have a wonderful life. Okay, so here's scripture number one, Daniel 1, 8. Daniel 1, 8. Number two, 1 John 3.18. 1 John 3.18. Number 3, Proverbs 3, verses 1 and 2. Proverbs 3, verses 1 and 2. Number four, Matthew six thirty three. Matthew six thirty three. Number five, Jeremiah one five. Jeremiah one five. Number six, Luke eleven thirteen. Luke eleven thirteen. Number seven, here's a new one. Esther four fourteen. Esther four fourteen. Number eight, Matthew nineteen 
14. Matthew 19, 14. Number nine, 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. And the last one, number 10, 1 John 2, 12. 1 John 2, 12. I wonder if you're keeping score. Don't get slack. We're going to give a prize, so keep your score count for the family. And uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. I hope you're working on your project of, your, of our mini carnival. You saw what Andrew Carroll had, and uh, we're going to have fun with that. But there are other things and other people are doing that. But let her know what your project is going to be so we don't have two families doing the same thing or two people doing the same thing. All right. Now, our message for tonight is from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, because I feel like at that, this time that God is giving to us, God is really stopping us. I got a message on Sunday that is burning on my heart. And the Lord said to warn people that Jesus is coming soon. As terrible as all of this is, God in his mercy for us Christians has stopped the whole world, all of our activities, all the things that we've been doing, and we said we didn't have time for this, time for that. We were out of order in so many things. God has put a stop. And if we're smart, and I think I know most of you are, you're going to think about it. You're going to make things better for your life. I know in ministry, you know, sometimes we get so busy doing this and doing that. And, and you know, my mind is always spinning. And now God says, stop. Remember I told you. I think it was on Sunday that early in my ministry, God says, Barbara, you've been doing my work, but you're out of my will. And in Matthew 7, it says, only those that are doing the will of God are going to see the kingdom of heaven. So God is wanting us to drop everything. It's not about us. It's about him. And see if we're in right alignment. And so children... Tonight's lesson from Ephesians chapter 6 is addressing you, you know, and I want to say that all through life, I don't care if you get to be old like me, you're going to have to obey something or somebody, right? And so obedience is a very important part of our life, and we practice at home. And let me say this, that parents... You know, um, there's some guidelines here. I'm going to go, let's read the scriptures first, and I'll go into the guidelines I want to give you because in a family, we're all working together. So ki kids cannot be obedient if they don't have parents that have some guidelines for them. So in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. What is that promise? That it may be well with you. That means if you obey them, things are going to go well with you. And you may live long on earth. So you're going to have a good, wonderful, rich, blessed life. And you're going to live long. You know, I don't want to live long if my life is going to be miserable, right? But he says, if you honor your mother and father, you're going to have a good life and you're going to live long. And then it says, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Do you know why parents have to train children? And all of us adults know 
when we get old, it's hard to change our habits. So young people, as I said to you always, you're doing the best thing. You're giving yourself the greatest gift you can give to yourself by giving yourself to the Lord. Because when you get old, oh, they're so stubborn, they're so hard, they think they're so smart, they've learned so many things, and they don't want to come, and they're hard to train, okay? But when you, like you have a dog and you want to have a house pet, I think it's a good time to get a house pet. Go to the Humane Society and see if there's a stray dog or cat that needs a home. I think that might be a good project for you. you learn to take care of something other than yourself. But anyway, when you want to train them, you don't say, give me the oldest dog you have here. I want him to be trained to do some tricks. They're going to look at you and say, are you crazy? You get a little puppy who doesn't have bad habits. And then you train them and train them and train them and you repeat and you repeat until they do it right. And parents, that's what we need to do with the children. We need to make the rules, the guidelines, first of all, that are age appropriate. That means you're not going to tell a three-year-old that he has to do a chore that uh, is for an older child. So an age-appropriate rule, and when you make the rule, you need to explain it. Be sure, do you understand that I said you're not to come to the kitchen and you're not to touch this hot stove because you're going to get burned? Of course, if the child is stubborn and rebellious, when your back is turned, they're going to touch the hot stove and they're going to scream. And uh, I don't want to be unkind, but I think that if they do it when they're young, that's wonderful because they won't do it again the rest of their life. They learn something by their own experimentation. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we can trust our parents that when they say something is wrong, something is bad, don't do this, we will obey them. But you know, our sinful nature doesn't want to obey rules. This is what happened in the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve. God says, do not eat of that immediately. They were fascinated by that which was forbidden, the forbidden fruit. And I think that's our basic sinful nature. When mom says, don't open the cookie jar, I think we're attracted to that. And we think we can open it up and just take one and close it up so mom won't know anything. I don't know why we are, but that is our basic nature, okay? So I just want to explain that parents... You are to govern and order, you know, make your child's life orderly and teach them what is right and wrong. They, they don't know it unless you teach them. You need to train them to be obedient because the Bible says when we enforce that and teach them that, we are going to save their eternal soul from hell. Because when they fear and honor you, they will, as they grow older, fear and honor God. And when you're not around and they're way up on the mainland somewhere maybe and you, you cannot tell them what to do, they're going to have the fear of God and that's going to save them from going the wrong way. So you need to ingrain that in their spirit. So be careful and all. But, you know, I just want to say that... Um, we have the Bible as a guideline, so even if our parents are not very spiritual, or maybe they may not even be Christians, when we read the Bible and God says, don't do this or don't do that, we need to obey him. And of course, we've got the Ten Commandments, if you'd like to look it up, in Exodus chapter 20. So, learn the Bible. The Bible tells of itself. His word is a lamp to our feet and a light into our path. And if we hide it in our heart, we will not sin against God. Now, I know, you know, as we grow, we're not perfect. And I told you already, the sin that's going to take us to hell and eternally be separated from God is a sin of disobedience and rebellion. But once we receive Christ and we truly believe that Jesus paid the penalty for our sins on the cross, and we truly want to change and become like him and go to heaven. And we make that commitment, and we ask him to fill us with his spirit, and we invite him into our life. We're going to fall off the wagon sometimes. You know, we're, we're going to do things that are really not nice as you grow older. 
I, I had a talk with somebody today and they needed help and they felt so bad. They said, we didn't know whether we should call you because we haven't been coming to church in a long, long time, but we really need help. And I said, you know what? We've never forgotten you. We still love you. And Jesus wants you to come back. We're going to fall off the wagon. There's nobody perfect. I'll tell you this about me. Maybe parents don't like to tell it, but I make a point in telling this and that parents, you need to make age-appropriate rules but allow kids to learn to make their own decisions because if they're under your roof and you make every decision for them and say, you got to do this and you got to come to church and you got to, you know, whatever, and they may obey you while they're under your roof because if you're living under your roof, parents' roof, you need to obey them, even if you're 46 years old or whatever. Not referring to anybody in particular, but you know what I'm saying? In order to have order, we have to respect that. But, uh, allow them a little room because it's better for them to make a mistake under your roof so you can correct them and you can love them back into the kingdom and teach them what it is to be forgiven. We need to be merciful and forgiven, forgiving. Not all the time, because if every, every time they fall off the wagon, we say, oh, it's okay, it's okay. Nice little boy, you know, don't do it again. They're not going to learn. Sometimes they got to have that like in the right spot. Okay, that's the word of God too. But, you know, when I was growing up, I was the oldest in the family. June and Victor are, June is three years younger than me. Victor is four years younger than me. And I went to high school. And in high school, they were going to have a welcome dance. And I was on the committee. And, uh, but it was on a Friday night. And I know if I told my mom, my mom, once she says no, that's it. You cannot change her mind. She will think about it, but right is right and wrong is wrong. Once she makes up her mind, she's not going to change. You can't negotiate. So important times like that, I go straight to my dad. So I went to dad. I said, Dad, I said, you think about this, okay? You pray about this because uh, I have something to ask you. And I made it seem like I was so important. I said, they're having, and in those days, you know, Pentecostals didn't dance or go to dances. They were, thought it was sinful. And uh, so I said, we're having a big social, uh, welcome social uh, at the gym. And I'm on the committee, and I have to be there at 7 o'clock or whatever time it was. I said, and you know, I made him think like I was the most important person on the committee. I was just one of many, okay? And so I'm giving my spiel to him, and I said, uh, but by the way, Dad, I hope you you can overlook this, but uh, it is on a Friday night, our youth service night, but it's only one time in the whole year, and this is the first, you know, event we're going to have, and I just have to be there. My dad was very smart, you know, and he just looked at me, he listened to me, and he says, you know, Barbara, you're a born-again Christian, aren't you? I said, yes, I am. He says, aren't you filled with the Holy Spirit? I said, yes, I am. He says, you know, then I don't have to tell you what to do. You listen to the Holy Spirit. He'll tell you what to do. And I said, do you mean that I can go? He says, if that's what he says, yeah, you can go. I go, yes. I ran out. Yes. Oh, I can go. I was so happy. I didn't ask the Holy Spirit. I was just going to do it myself, right? But I wanted to go so badly. I was falling off the wagon, as you can see. And so, you know, uh, my mom was not very pleased. But my dad did say this, Barbara, but I want you to know, you're an example to your brother and sister. You're an example to the rest of the young people. And you're about the oldest one. And they're going to be looking at what you do. So be careful. I thought, oh, all right, you know. So I went, got all dressed, went with my friends. I was having so much fun. We set it up and all like that. Then the dance was supposed to start. And the music started. And, I, and all the girls were on little kind of on the wall. And the guys were coming. And I saw this guy coming straight for me. And all of a sudden, I got the fear of the Lord. And I 
looked and I said, oh God, don't let him come to me, don't let him come to me. And uh, he started coming and I go, and he was surprised. I said, and so he was embarrassed and he turned away. And then I went to the bathroom and I said, Jesus, don't come tonight. I don't want to miss heaven. Please don't come tonight. And I just cried there and I was so afraid. But my point in this is, you know, my father allowed me to go through that. And the Holy Spirit, I'm sure he prayed much for me that the Holy Spirit would teach me that I needed to put God first on Friday night. It was a youth service. And you know what? After that experience, he never had any problems with me because I didn't want to be in the wrong place at the wrong time when the trumpet of the Lord sounds. And thank God it hasn't sounded yet. But young people, the reason why we love you so much and work so hard with you and spend time with you is because we know that it is a very difficult, much more difficult time for you to stay in the straight and narrow. They got drugs out there and alcohol out there and all kinds of bad things out there and people and some of your friends have talked about suicide and so you're exposed to so much more but I want to tell you as pastor you're very precious to me especially if your parents don't come to church and and you come because you love the Lord. We love you. I love you. You know that. And I will always have time for you because I know it's not easy. For me, I mean, for me to, you know, do what I did, I fought, fell off the wagon, but it wasn't that bad, the consequences. But in now, in these days, if you fall off the wagon, it's probably you might take the wrong drug and for the rest of your life you'll be controlled by that drug and you're going to end up in prison or in, in, in a shelter somewhere without a life. So I pray that whatever we say to you, you will listen, you know, and I just want to say to you, because there's some older ones, adults perhaps, and I can see in my mind those listening here to me tonight, some of you who are burdened and frustrated and sad and, and longing for hope. You're hurting so much. We're all hurting, but you especially because maybe you've lost your job or you've been rejected by your family. Let me tell you this. This is why the message of the cross is so important. We are all sinners, all of us. Remember King David? Some of you have said to Carol and to me, oh, you don't know what I've done. You don't know how bad I've been. It does not matter. I mean, you can look at any one of us. Nobody is perfect. King David wasn't per perfect. We sing about him and we praise him, but do you know that he loved Jesus because when he committed adultery and had an affair with a man's wife and then had that man killed, I mean, how awful those sins were. And yet, if you read Psalm 51 and Psalm 32, you read his confession and his repentance, and he says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. God is a God who wants to restore. He loves us. He forgives us. He wants to restore everything that was stolen when we were foolish and rebellious and plain stupid sometimes, and he wants to rebuild our lives, and he's here to do it. In closing, I'd like to give you an opportunity, whether you're young or old, Parents, you have a tremendous responsibility. Don't fight with each other. Work together to bring up your precious children in the ways of the Lord. You be godly and set the example. And we've got a tremendous responsibility. And as pastor, I want to help all the families stay close to the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. This is a tough time to be when all the pressures of this world and everything is like going crazy to keep focus on the Lord. So this is why we need to Take care of our young people. Take care of our families. Take care of each other and love each other. But the best thing about Jesus, let me tell you this, people may never re forget the bad things you did, especially if you went to jail once, you know, and it was all over the paper maybe. Or your family. They know your innermost mistakes. And they may never fully forget the wonderful news about Jesus' mercy is that when you repent 
and say I'm sorry. Even if the devil tries to remind you how awful it was, how bad it was, all sin is bad in the eyes of God. God not only forgives you, but he forgets. Don't you want to have that forgiveness? Don't you want to have that burden lifted from you? Oh, I see him looking down at some of you who are in despair. You're, you feel guilty about where you are now because you are where you are because of bad decisions and you think God doesn't love you. He is love. He loves you. Let us pray. Our gracious heavenly Father, I just praise you and thank you because I feel your love being poured out on the families, on our children, on your children that have not turned to you yet but are wondering how you will receive them. And you're looking for them. Help them not to live under condemnation. Help them not to let their past remind them of who they were. Let them see themselves redeemed and restored, set free as a newborn baby. And if you're ready to do this and you haven't done it before, or if you've done it but you've never gotten rid of the burden of sin, just say this, say, Dear Jesus, Thank you for loving me just the way I am. Thank you for dying on the cross to blot out my awful sins. I was foolish. I made wrong decisions. I did bad things. I hurt people. I hurt you. But I come to you humbly, asking you to forgive me and I want to invite you to come into my life and be the Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. Write my name in your book of life. Give me another chance, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, for all those who pray that prayer, I pray that the burden of sin will be lifted, that the scars of their horrible deeds will be under the blood of Jesus and completely forgotten by them and by others because I know they're forgotten by you and give us joy, the joy of our salvation. Fill each one with your joy. Lift that burden of guilt and sin and condemnation. Wherever people are, just fill them with your wonderful joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. And we'll see you tomorrow night. Tomorrow night is our healing service. So ask your friends if they need prayer and then gather those prayer requests as we come together. We're going to pray for the sick especially. But those of you who know Dalik Sai, let's pray for her. She is undergoing cancer treatment right now and needs much prayer. So God bless you. I love you. Stay close to Jesus. He loves you too. Bye.